today on Inside the Issues, I speak with T.V. Paul on the subject of his new book, The Warrior State, Pakistan in the Contemporary World. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. My name is Dr. Andrew Thompson. I'm an adjunct assistant professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and program officer at the Balsley School of International Affairs. Every week on the program, we're joined by an expert in the fields of international public policy, global governance, or some other aspect of international affairs. Today, my guest is Professor T.V. Paul. Dr. Paul is the James McGill Professor of International Relations in the Department of Political Science at McGill University, and he is the author of a new book, The Warrior State, Pakistan in the Contemporary World. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me here. What prompted you to write the book? I have seen a lot of new books, especially on Pakistan, a lot of them written by good journalists, uh, good um, diplomats and others, but I haven't seen a good uh, scholarly work on Pakistan in a while. So my effort here is to bring in different scholarly literature uh, that uh, can explain Pakistan's situation rather than just describe it. And I have brought in uh, historical sociology literature, international relations, security studies, comparative politics, uh, and a whole host of uh, ideas that can bear upon uh, the predicament that Pakistan faces, especially in the security area, both internal and external. Right. So what is a warrior state? A warrior state is uh, uh, basically a state that pays enormous attention to uh, military security. Security is comprehensive as this institution deals with a whole, whole host of issues. But if your main purpose of the state is a protection from predatory enemies, uh, then uh, you are putting all, almost all of your major efforts in that direction, then it could become a warrior state. Now, this could be positive, this could be negative, and uh, you can get a warrior state entrenched for a long period of time for various societal reasons, and that can also generate certain pathologies, and uh, that's what I discuss in the book. Now, you do argue that Pakistan suffers from what you call a geostrategic curse. What do you mean by this? This is sort of my main explanation for Pakistan's uh, predicament or d difficulty to develop as a, a modern uh, democratic uh, state. Uh, I borrow this idea from uh, developmental economics. They use the concept of resource curse, and right. some uh, coin the term uh, oil curse. Others talk about foreign aid curse. So I am basically using the same concept, that if, you're, if you get too much money uh, by part of being a great power, geopolitical uh, rivalries and conflicts, then the incentive for modernizing your society, extracting from within, uh, decreases. And so what I am arguing is that the structural condition that Pakistan has been in since the Cold War period, uh, it benefited tremendously from the U.S. initially of course, the U.S. Uh, cuts off the aid, but then the Afghan war uh, with the Soviet Union, and then since 9-11. These funds have brought in uh, enough money to sustain a kind of a warrior or military-oriented right. state, but not enough to develop uh, along with um, a, a modern economic plan. And so I compare in the book uh, South Korea and Taiwan, two other states that also right. face existential challenges, yet they became what they call developmental states. They put a lot of emphasis on trade uh, with the United States and the Western uh, countries. And as a result, they have become strong economies and very important uh, trading partners. Now, Pakistan initially did that a little bit under Ayub Khan's period, but then it, uh, for various reasons, some of it are beyond its own control, uh, it continued this geostrategic uh, rent uh, rather than developing its internal uh, market or external trade. Right. So this, this concept is, I think, is a useful tool to explain Pakistan's difficulty. And it can also explain some other countries like Egypt, for instance, Philippines, the Philippines under uh, Marcos regime. Um, and so it is a, a good tool to explain this uh, situation. Now, you also refer to uh, Pakistan as a garrison state, um, specifically when you're describing the tumultuous relationship between the military and civilian leaders. Um, can you explain this idea and how it has really stunted 
This well, idea is already in the sociology literature and military history literature and uh, people have written on the subject that uh, garrison states are again kind of another term for the warrior state. Uh, puts a lot of emphasis on national security, military security. Uh, so uh, Laswell, the sociologist who developed the concept, argues that uh, a garrison state is where the specialists in violence are the most important people uh, of the society. And so this concept is essentially I'm, I'm explaining uh, using this, but at the same time showing that Pakistan had democracy occasionally, they call hybrid democracy to some extent, but the military remains big veto players. And that is the sense of a garrison state right. uh, in, in this context. Thank you very much. For the next section, I'd like to pick up on this idea and, and start by talking about the elite in Pakistan. You are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back to the program. Dr. Paul, I'd like to pick up on our last discussion uh, and talk about Pakistan's elite. And in the book, you're very critical of the role they've played in perpetuating the idea, this idea of a warrior state. Mm -hmm. um, can you say a little bit about the elite in Pakistan and uh, some of the leadership failures that you mentioned, that you talk about in the book? Uh, Pakistan's misfortune was that there wasn't a good successor group of people after Jinnah's time. Uh, Jinnah lived really for a year after independence. So Pakistan relied on bureaucratic elite, military elite, uh, who were more uh, powerful in the system. And the civilian uh, second-ranking uh, leadership was missing from the beginning. Uh, but then they had the opportunity, you know, with the Bhutto, um, it was Ulbikar Ali Bhutto and uh, his daughter, uh, Benazir Bhutto. Uh, unfortunately, they also didn't succeed in making the dramatic changes. Part of it was that the military wouldn't allow them to some extent. But the fear of the military coup always uh, persisted. Part of it was some of them, some of their policies were driven by um, ethnic ideas or, or in a particular crafty policies. And also, they also inculcated this notion of uh, warrior state very intensely. Uh, so, for instance, um, Sulfikar Ali Bhutto, you know, is the one who starts the nuclear program. Um, Benazir Bhutto was uh, behind support to the Taliban to some right. extent, fearing that the military otherwise would not support them. And also the AQ Khan network, this happened during Benazir's time. Uh, and then you have a period of uh, uh, civilian uh, Nawaz Sharif uh, tries to make some changes. He was actually a bit more successful if you look at his uh, Lahore process but that was uh, with Indian uh, Prime Minister uh, Bajpai for a peace process. But he was thwarted by the military under uh, General Musharraf, <laughs> who would uh, start the Kargil offensive. And, right. and so now we have uh, an opportunity. The Pakistani elite is, there are a lot of bright people in Pakistan. And uh, they are starting to look at uh, what went wrong, and they are making some progress. I must say that uh, one has to look at the small steps they are taking. But they need that little breathing space, for, especially from the military, which the military is actually taking a back seat, which mm. is actually quite a good thing. But they need a new strategy, you know, a trading strategy, a developmental strategy. This is what I'm pushing for them <laughs> to think about and you know, compare uh, with Indonesia, with uh, Turkey, uh, right. with Korea's, you know, I'm a Korean, not all the both Koreas, Korea with Taiwan, and see what you can do within this milieu they are in because they are in a very difficult situation. They cannot sustain by external aid or uh, the expatriate money they get. Right. Uh, they need to develop society and, and education, literacy. They need the technical, uh, technically skilled people. They need, they need to become part of the economic globalization, not the other bad part of globalization. Right. And all that requires uh, a lot of uh, change in their attitudes as well as their strategies. So my, my problem with the elite is that once you realize that your strategy is not working, uh, the best uh, you know, managerial types would start refocusing, you know, what, what else we need to do. Right. And in Pakistan's case, unfortunately, <laughs> that didn't happen, although slowly that seems to be happening. Now, shifting gears slightly, how does religion factor into this narrative? I'm not an expert on religion per se, but I find the uses of uh, uh, use of political religion. Uh, I'm more interested in the political aspect. 
for uh, political purposes. Uh, they tend to create a kind of uh, dynamics that you see in Pakistan, a sectarian dynamics, because uh, Pakistan was founded on the basis of Islam. But uh, who's Islam? That's the big question they always right. faced. Which sect should dominate? And in this uh, case, uh, the, you know, the Sunni-Shia divide has been uh, growing, you know, because of the inability to bridge these gaps. So Islam has been a very in, important force, but the peaceful aspects of Islam, you know, they have to probably emphasize more of that and develop the, you know, they have eclectic understanding, Sufism, for instance. But uh, in this case, the moment you use a political religion by different leaders, they have generated certain dynamics that are now beyond their control, vis-a-vis -vis Taliban or vis-a-vis -vis different uh, forces that are trying to disrupt Pakistan. So it is a, it is a comprehensive uh, understanding of nation building based on different dynamics that we need. And uh, scholars need to focus on these together, what, what is bringing uh, these conditions to Pakistan the way it is. So I'm not critical of religion per se. I'm just saying that uh, we have to be very careful when we, uh, or, or leaders, uh, use religion for political purposes. Right. Now, uh, along these same lines, you do suggest in the book that there's a, a fairly weak or underdeveloped civil society in Pakistan. Um, why is this the case? The civil society is divided, as you can see. Um, uh, part of it is Pakistan doesn't have a big middle class. It's rather small. And then the civil society has been educated in this sort of narrative, which is uh, the, a, another hallmark of what you call the warrior state, essentially threats and uh, existential threat especially. They have good reasons to think that way. I mean, the big size India is next door. And, right. uh, giving them a lot of difficulties in various areas. They also worry about Afghanistan and the great powers are intervening the, in their uh, s space. But uh, the, the civil society needed to be developed and you needed the democratic political parties to begin with. And Pakistan, as I said, from the beginning lacked that political parties to mobilize the civil society. But of lately, Pakistan had, uh, you know, like lawyers, uh, movements right. that really helped to topple the military regime of uh, General Musharraf, but the problem is they don't sustain that. You know, they, they do one episode and then they lose their uh, ability to maintain the intense uh, control they need to maintain societal change. So, so society is divided, as you can see, um, and so education is part of the challenge. They need to get more technical and scientific education as well as liberal arts education. And so civil society needs uh, quite a bit of uh, transformation in terms of how to work for democracy. But impressively though, the media is really showing a lot mm -hmm. of uh, good uh, writers and you know, critical uh, yet very powerful writers. But that's mostly what I read is English media and I don't know whether the uh, Urdu media is penetrating that much. Uh, so, right. But my sense is that uh, they do have the critical mass of uh, intellectuals and writers but the, uh, the middle class that is needed uh, to uh, bring up democracy, sustain democracy, is what probably is needed. Right. Thank you very much. For the next section, I'd like to talk about Pakistan's neighborhood. You've been watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. Welcome back. Professor Paul, um, I'd like to focus our discussion on the region and Pakistan's neighborhood. The relationship with India is perhaps the biggest uh, challenge, as you note in the book, for overcoming this idea of the warrior state complex. Can you say a little bit about the relationship with India and how it is affecting Pakistan's development? Um, this is one of the most complex rivalries you can ever get uh, in uh, the 20th century and the 21st century that's continuing, partly because it, is, um, uh, it involves a lot of, uh, lot of uh, dimensions beyond just territory. Obviously, Kashmir uh, is a primary source of that initial conflict, but then it uh, uh, developed into a trajectory that includes now water, uh, and as I discuss in the book, status competition. Right. Uh, this is something that most scholars have ignored. Uh, you start off by looking at the history of where Pakistan comes from. 
the idea of Pakistan, it is at least some of them thought that a successor state to the Mughal Empire. Mughals controlled India and the Muslims controlled India for a thousand years until the 1857 revolt when the British sidelined them. And so it was like a civilizational uprising and uh, the Congress party of, of course uh, did not think that uh, they would be that strong so they didn't give them the importance they needed. And so Jinnah got very disenchanted, but Jinnah thought that these two successor states would be co-equals. Uh, territorial divisions would be they will get more, but they didn't. They didn't get the entire Punjab, Bengal, right. and they were hoping for that. So India would emerge as this uh, big state, and then the Kashmir conflict starts. Uh, and this is uh, the starting point of this uh, intense rivalry. But then it became a, a question of uh, how to maintain balance of power, parity with India. One of the running themes in Pakistani uh, military or strategic discourse is what you call strategic parity. That they right. want to create an equality with India in terms of military, in terms of all the other dimensions that include status. So the problem is they are, before Bangladesh was, uh, seceded, uh, one uh, to four was the you know, size disparity. But now it is uh, or eight to one, or, uh, right now it's eight to one on many dimensions. Right. I impossible to create a parity unless you get outside help, uh, which is they're successful in getting that with this, right. the United States initially, then China. Right. Uh, but uh, as uh, the Cold War ended and the uh, globalization started, India liberalized, and then the U.S. changed its policy towards India, they're finding it very difficult to maintain that balance. And that's right. why they went to nuclear weapons to some extent. Right. Uh, Indian policies are part of the challenge here, but Indian policies are now moving away. The original fear of the Pakistanis that India would not want them to exist as a state. That I don't think is very prominent in the Indian discourse at all anymore. Right. Nobody in India, as far as I know, except the extreme right Hindu fundamentalists talk about Pakistan disappearing from the map. So it's a question of the fear is still persisting. And then 71 war, India uh, helped the, the Bengalis to secede. And that generated a lot of uh, intense uh, feeling among the Pakistanis. The problem is none of this can be changed now. And then they uh, adopted a very aggressive policy in Kashmir that included uh, non-state actors and uh, uh, giving India back in, in kind right. as they did in the Bangladesh situation. So this generates the Indians react. They don't necessarily uh, come up with new ideas often, but sometimes they do. Right now, there is a lot of thinking in India about uh, opening up the trade routes, and, and Pakistanis are also coming around. But the problem is the rivalry is so deep-rooted that they have great difficulty sort of cutting out of that or, or, or uh, creating different pockets in terms of uh, sustaining their, their cooperation. India and China have a rivalry too, but sure. they have a big trade relationship. Now, this yeah. is what people are arguing that, you know, you can't settle all your territorial disputes in one day. Uh, the Pakistani argument is that we need to settle Kashmir until then we won't uh, trade with you. Right. Uh, but that is a mistake. That's my, uh, at least those who believe that, uh, mm -hmm. if they have good trade relationship, perhaps uh, the, the, the military issues, the, the, the territorial issues could be discussed in a more friendly manner, you know, because without that, uh, forcing India to concede uh, is unlikely to happen. And then we also forget that what the Kashmiris want. See, originally the idea was they will go either India or Pakistan, but now the uh, majority of them want peace and security as whatever uh, uh, surveys have been conducted. Very few are really thinking of joining either Pakistan or some probably want to be with India, especially the Hindus right. and the, the Buddhists. So we are in a very difficult situation with that original claim, what exactly Kashmiris want. And, and you start uh, asking that question, then perhaps this shouldn't be the main focus of Pakistan because uh, Kashmir is uh, an important element, but it shouldn't cause this, um, I I in other words, it shouldn't be the main stumbling block for all discussions about everything, right. uh, trade included. And I think some people are realizing that, the need for um, more interactions and civil societies connecting, and over a period of time perhaps come up with the new solutions, as General Musharraf came up with right. the idea of relaxing the border and uh, between the two sides of Kashmir, etc. And what about Afghanistan. Uh, what are the implications for Pakistan as the war in Afghanistan winds down and NATO forces begin to tax it? This is another big topic I tackle in one of the chapters of the book. Uh, it has a long history of uh, Afghan conflict. I argue that a lot of these ideas, that especially Pakistan, 
uh, and the elite have um, used in Afghanistan, uh, they come out of the British Raj, you know, sort of keeping Afghanistan as a kind of vassal state or buffer state. <laughs> and uh, strategic depth, the notion, which is a little dated concept in military history. And so there's a historical pattern to that. And of course, the Pashtuns are divided between these two lands. And so this is one element that is very important here. Um, it is not a good, uh, at least from what we see, unless we have a stability in uh, Afghanistan, it's going to hurt Pakistan. Right. Because uh, the moment Taliban uh, wins, or Pakistan will be uh, forced to take sides with the Taliban, as they did. But uh, that is not going to help them. That will mean the Pakistani Taliban will also try to assert themselves, and right. that's, that's already happening. So what is needed is Pakistan, along with the regional players, India, Russia, uh, China, Saudi Arabia, Iran, to come up with a grand plan for transforming this region, Central Asian states. Uh, right now, they are all in a wait and watch mode, uh, as if right. uh, you know some inanimate forces would uh, change the dynamics. Here, I think uh, real statesmanship is needed, because this is in the interest of everybody including Indians and Pakistan is right. everybody that uh, Afghanistan is stabilized. Afghans, of course. And so what is missing is uh, that element. And I think the U.S. should take a leadership role in creating a kind of rapprochement that uh, obviously is difficult, but at least try, you know, beyond. There's some back-channel discussions are going on, you know, but not enough to create the kind of conditions necessary for peace in Afghanistan. So I do worry about that a lot and discuss in the book that pa it's in the interest of Pakistan that Afghanistan doesn't uh, get into the old 90s situation. Even though geopolitically, in a narrow sense, it may help the right. Pakistani military or whatever, but it, in the end, it has hurt them. Look at what happened since then. Right. Thank you very much. For the last section of the show, I'd like to uh, shift the discussion to uh, Pakistan's nuclear weapons program. You have been watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. Welcome back. Professor Paul, you alluded to this in the last portion of the show. Um, Pakistan is a nuclear power. Um, what prompted Pakistan to develop its nuclear weapons program in the first place? The, I think it's the 71 war that uh, Pakistan lost its uh, half of its territory, uh, in the Bangladesh war I'm referring to. And after that, um, uh, Mr. Bhutto holds a meeting and uh, asks the scientists to come up with a plan and uh, successful in right. over a period of time. So once again, it's not just a, a typical uh, military issue, it's also part of the strategic parity that I was discussing with you. Uh, the idea that Pakistan has to have an equality in terms of military capabilities, a balance of power concept, right. and then deterrence, uh, because of the fear that uh, India has conventional superiority, that India would, um, if it wants, you know, uh, attack Pakistan or dismember it, all kinds of fears they have. So nuclear weapons were conceived as uh, one of the existential tools. And then India was slowly developing uh, up to a point. It, it tested in 74, then it really didn't continue that as far as we know until 1980s in reaction to Pakistan. So Indian tests really uh, propelled them to accelerate this process, but right. either the process started before that, uh, 72, I think it was the first meeting. So nuclear weapons were viewed as a way for survival of the state in this milieu of uh, intense rivalry with India and equalizing the relationship. Uh, that is very critical. It's not just a, a military weapon, it's also a political weapon. Right. And then getting the kind of status that they thought they lost after, uh, after the Bangladesh war. So since then, there is been a, an arms race going on in South Asia. India has been also building right. in the context of relations with China. So you have a trilateral or triadic competition going on uh, in the nuclear arena. But Pakistan views all the Indian development as directed to it, to, sure. toward it, not necessarily toward China. And China and Pakistan have also a relationship. China has supplied Pakistan nuclear materials, even mm -hmm. design as far as some right. evidence shows. So this is in that context that they have built the nuclear weapons. But the problem with there, they have doctrine that at least unofficial doctrine suggests that nuclear weapons 
are very important, not only for uh, this kind of security, but even to prevent a kind of crisis situation, that economic crisis, for instance, or India putting a blockade or anything that will affect them. So seven or eight reasons why they could use nuclear weapons, kind of a first use doctrine. Right. Now, this is in the context of deterrence, obviously, but it probably has gone beyond deterrence now because some estimates suggest that Pakistan has 110 or plus weapons or ability to create that many weapons, more than what India has. And that Pakistan is also developing short-range missiles, 60-kilometer uh, range missiles, and putting them on the border. In response to India's what they call the Cold Start uh, doctrine, where essentially after the parliament attack uh, by the non-state actors, uh, the Indian argument is that they need something to mobilize faster than what they did at that time, and even after the Mumbai attacks. So it's a reactive strategy, but Pakistan views it as a threatening strategy in order to deter that they right. need these uh, weapons. The problem, though, is that nuclearizing this border, very tense border, is extremely uh, difficult. And uh, right. we don't know what the consequences if the, in a crisis situation when the command control uh, setup can be cut off. And that is the fear of many nuclear arms controllers, especially that uh, this has the potential for catastrophe, especially in the context of non-state actors trying to capture some of those nuclear weapons. Right. So uh, on the other hand, they have uh, engaged in a lot of negotiations with India and Pakistan. They have uh, agreements. But in a crisis, it's very difficult to predict how things will go. So people who believe that they need nuclear weapons, from at least for uh, foreseeable future, but they can, both parties can agree on what you call a limited deterrent. They should not fall into the trap of what you call the Cold War era intense nuclear arms race. In fact, that will divert their attention from all the issues they could solve. Deterrence is not transformative. It doesn't change the dynamics. It just maintains. Right. A balance of power is also maintaining right. the status quo. So if you want to negotiate and uh, change the situation, then weapons are not the answer. And this is one of the big challenges. They confuse between deterrence and uh, long-term change. Right. Uh, for that to come, there has to be an attitudinal change and also strategic change in the environment where I think the leading actors can play a big role, which they are not playing at this point as much as they should be. And uh, building on that, in your conclusion, you argue that Pakistan is trapped in this mentality of a, of a warrior state. Broadly, what needs to change for them to get out of this trap? So I go back to my original argument, where essentially the geostrategy occurs. And then I also discuss a set of ideas that, uh, realpolitik ideas, Hobbesian ideas that drive Pakistani elite. Um, but I don't want to blame them for what they are in situation now, to some extent that what I'm trying to argue is that they need to learn from other countries that faced existential threats, such as Korea, such as Taiwan. And they need to adapt some of those techniques. Even military regimes, you know, I uh, compare uh, with Turkey, with Indonesia. Uh, Egypt is not the good case for them. Um, and then I, I come to the argument that, uh, you know, things can change in a short period of time if they adopt certain strat strategic choices. China was, uh, until Deng Xiaoping came around, was uh, taking a path that was not taking them anywhere in that right. sense. Uh, so it is that, that initial policy changes that they adopt would be very critical here. Uh, crises have to be turned into opportunities. This is where they can actually learn a le lesson from India. The 1991 uh, economic crisis that led to the reforms that we sure. see in India. Yeah. So Pakistan hasn't had that kind of a crisis, <laughs> or crises are there, but always foreign aid comes in, and now the IMF and World Bank are giving them right. aid. Saudi Arabia comes in with money, or somebody will be there to give them the enough to sustain their uh, survival. That is not enough. The, the elite has to think of what else is needed to make this country a developmental state, even though they may not be able to settle all their disputes with their neighbors. It's right. very difficult disputes. So they need to do both, become a good military security state, at the same time also focus on development, land reforms. They have to do that. It's right. a very land aristocracy is controlling their system. They need to uh, install educa education institutions, like technical institutions. They are very weak in that. Infrastructure, water management. Obviously, right. they have a bit discussion with uh, India or, or debate with that. But they themselves have to control the water that flows through the, the Indus and the other rivers. Right. 
and the water just is wasted and big floods come in and go and then there is a lot of lack of uh, water supply. So for that they need to create a regional uh, understanding too and India comes to the picture very much. I do think that water is one area where they've shown that they can co cooperate. And here is another opportunity that the leaders of this country should discuss ways by which water can be developed and uh, electricity can be developed, which will be good for the Kashmiris as well as the Pakistanis. Because electricity, they, then they can supply to the uh, national uh, grid, uh, international grid, and also uh, gas pipelines and other sources. Right. So a grand economic plan is needed. That should include the regional states. Right. Cannot be a single-handed effort. And trade, opening up of borders, uh, and creating a kind of community that will lead to sustainable peace. Right. Thank you so much. We're out of time. This has been wonderful, and congratulations on, on the release of the book. And thank you to our audience for, uh, for joining us today. You've been watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. <laughs>